My name is Gordon Fry, and uh, I'm talking about 19th century firearms, obviously. Um, I should look at my notes, I suppose. That'd be a brilliant really thing. Um, to begin with, part of my rationale for doing this program is I know a lot of you like to make up cool guns and stuff. But it's been my opinion. You don't need guns for Anyway, um, a lot of people are making up their different guns and stuff for steampunk. You should start from something that really was, and then move from there, extrapolate. Because that's what they did. They came from this certain ethos, this Victorian ethos, this mindset of what a gun ought to look like. Uh, you look at 16th century guns, and you say, that doesn't look like a gun. Well, they didn't know what they were supposed to look like, so they started from scratch. And as you progress, the style of what is supposed to look like a gun changes over time. Today, we have these plastic things that look like Buck Rogers eye has. Age, it makes certain sense. But if you were to show that to somebody from 1870 and say, This is a gun, they'd say, No, it isn't. That's not a gun. So if you're going to extrapolate to a modern concept, start from an 1870s, 80s, whatever <coughs> viewpoint first. Okay. Although breech loading, loading from the back end, had existed since the very beginning of firearms, uh, for the most part it was found to be much more efficient and safe to load guns from the front. Because it was that there's a lot of hot gases that happen when gunpowder combusts. That's what's pushing the bullet out. If you do not have a good breech seal, not only does it push the bullet out, it pushes a lot of hot gases right back where your face happens to be. And that was considered to be mm, an un unnecessary uh, complication to shooting them. Um, so I'm going to start off with probably one of the standards of the frontier, which was a double barrel shotgun. Just about everybody owned a double barrel shotgun. Uh, and they lasted, muzzle loading shotguns lasted for a long, long time on the frontier, even in the 1890s, turn of the century, because they were cheap. And they, because they used loose ammunition in order, in other words, you put in the powder, put a wad down, and put in your shot, they were cheaper to shoot and also more versatile. If you're going to go duck hunting one day and deer hunting the next day, you use a bird shot, and then you draw it or you shot it, and then you can put in buckshot. Um, as opposed to the store bought ammunition, which you had to buy separate cartridges for each one, you only had to buy one kind of powder and one kind of cap, and you could make your own lead bullets from uh, lead bars. Aspect. This particular weapon actually is a combination gun. It's uh, smooth bore on one side, 20 gauge. The other side is rifle, 62 caliber. And this actually came from South Africa. It's got a baobab tree engraved on the side. And I discovered that the point of aim with the sights for the rifle at 100 yards, it's exactly the same point aim for the smoothbore at 50 yards. So I call it a lion gun. Figure, you shoot at him at 100 yards, by the time you get around and get moving your trigger finger back to the second trigger, he's probably at 50 yards. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, these were a very popular uh, type of weapon. Oh, I should mention this guy here. That's Lieutenant Powhatan Clark, and Frederick Remington made a sketch of him. He was a lieutenant in the 10th U.S. Cavalry, also known as the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, officially, they were sometimes called the, uh, the color, 10th Colored Cavalry, but the officers of the 10th Cavalry refused to put that in there. They were just 10th United States Cavalry. Powhatan Clark won the Medal of Honor for rescuing one of his troopers uh, in the line of fire. Unfortunately, before the, uh, before the Spanish-American War, he actually drowned in a river crossing. Drowning was a very common form of death in the West because he said, well, there's no rivers. Yeah, but the ones that are there can be pretty rough. Anyway, so I'm sort of uh, patterning my garb after him because I thought it would be cool. <laughs> and when I first started doing this impression uh, a couple of uh, decades ago, I looked a lot more like him. <laughs> okay. In the 1830s, uh, 
the original steampunk, a guy by the name of Samuel Colt, started working on his revolving com uh, firearm concept. The first ones he made were rifles, he made pistols. <clears throat> they were very complex, fairly delicate, but one of the big customers of the early ones was the Republic of Texas, his Navy. And the Republic of Texas bought a number of them. Sam Houston disbanded the Navy. The guns went into storage in Austin. And a Texas Ranger captain by the name of Jack Hayes, John Coffee Hayes, discovered, hey, wait a minute, there's a bunch of these multi-shot guns sitting here in storage. My Rangers could use them. So he went <clears throat> and had them issued to him, and he passed them out to his Rangers. They got into a fight with the Comanches, who usually would wipe out the Rangers. Uh, 80 Comanches against 15 Rangers. The Rangers won this time. And everybody went, ooh, <laughs> this is different. <laughs> When the Mexican-American War started over Texas becoming, uh, entering into the United States, uh, these Texans immediately were brought into federal service, and they said, we want more revolvers. And the government said, okay, they're expensive, we'll see what we can do. Colt had gone out of business, but he was willing to get back into business if there was enough money. And so he built a revolver, uh, with, uh, he collaborated with the Texas Ranger captain by the name of Samuel Walker, who was later killed in combat. And uh, the Walker pistol, a big hunk of iron, was the first U.S. Army officially adopted revolver. The officers who were uh, inspecting them made some suggestions. They could make it a little smaller, a little lighter, and the result was the Colt's Dragoon. Called the Dragoon because that's what the cavalry, our cavalry was generally called, the first and second uh, Dragoon. Um, it's a six shot, 44 caliber weapon. Walker wanted it stout enough that it would actually pierce a Comanche war shield, which is made out of very heavy buffalo raw, rawhide, <coughs> uh, and also to drop a horse. Okay, they were generally designed to be worn on the horse itself. But guys pretty quickly discovered, geez, I like this. I don't want, if I get dismounted, I want to keep my gun with me. And so, uh, so they generally started putting them in pistol cases, which later, the term holster, which originally was, of course, just for the bag, the box on your saddle, became transferred to the belt. Uh, these dragoons became extremely popular with the Argonauts, who were heading off to the west in search of gold in California. They sold for $25 at the factory and $150 in the gold fields. They were considered a prime piece of uh, equipment to have. However, as I said, they're big. Shortly thereafter, Colt came up with a smaller version of the pocket model. It's a 31 caliber instead of a 44 caliber. It was extremely popular. Colt made about 30,000 dragoons, they made 325,000 of these. Everybody had one. Yes, well, they're small, light, and everybody can carry them. But they were also considered maybe not quite heavy enough. Okay. So Colt came back and said, okay, how about one in the middle, 36 caliber? Now, we call it the Navy for the reason that, well, everybody called it the Navy. They thought, oh, 36 caliber, but that must be the Navy caliber. It has nothing to do with that has to do with the cylinder engraving, part of Colt's, basically you'd call product placement or product uh, trademark, was he had these pressed engravings on the cylinders. And this one is the naval scene. And it says engage May 23rd, 1843. That happened to be the last engagement of the Texas, Republic of Texas's Navy against the Mexican Navy. Now, there's some really cool aspects of that particular uh, engagement in that the Republic of Texas had actually rented their navy to the Republic of the Yucatan, who was trying to get away from Mexico. Almost all of the officers of the Repu Republic of Texas's navy were former United States naval officers. Almost all of the officers of the Mexican navy were Royal Navy officers on half pay. The Republic of Texas navy had entirely sailing. They all, all they had was sailing ships. Most of the Republic of Mexico's Navy were steamships. This is the only case in which, a, the last case, the only case 
in which a sailing navy defeated a steam navy. And because the Republic of Texas had bought Colt's revolvers and saved them from bankruptcy, at least the first time around, he wanted to commemorate this. When it came out, it was called the Ranger. The Ranger. But everybody saw this naval scene and said, oh, cool, this must be a Navy gun. So it became the Navy. Um, Colt made about 200,000 of these in the years they were made between 1850 and 1873. Everybody calls them, uh, says it's a 51 Navy, but it actually came out in 50, just like the 49 pocket model came out in 50. It's just like ours, you know. <laughs> Now another interesting aspect of the Navy was that uh, Colt had a, uh, he set up a factory in London in the 1850s because he was selling lots and lots of guns to the English. And uh, although the English gun makers pretty quickly caught on that, oh, we can make revolvers too, uh, Colt continued, although he closed down his factory, he continued selling lots of guns through his office in London. And then continued selling Navy Colt, the cap and ball revolvers, well into the 1880s until they ran out of them. Because people going to like Africa or Asia or whatnot, they couldn't buy fixed ammunition, but they could always buy lead, powder, and caps. Better to have six shots you know you have than as many shots as you want that you can't get. Oh yeah, we need some more stuff. Now the, that's a cartridge. Doesn't look like a cartridge to you, but it's a paper, Self-contained, well, self-contained, paper cartridge. It's got the ball on one end, it's made out of paper, wrapped in a tube, tied off on one end with the ball and then the powder. This tail here, you flip up with your thumb, rip it open with your teeth. My soldiers had to have two teeth that met. So they could rip it open, <laughs> pour it down the barrel, boom, then you prime it either with a cap, or if it was a flintlock, you used a little bit of that first, the powder in the, uh, in the flintlock. And then you fire it. It's made for a higher rate of fire, but they're a little delicate. Next shot. Now these are, are cartridges for the uh, Navy Colts. They're made out of they, either paper or they, could, they made them out of gut, too. And you just stuff the thing in the front, and that's what this cool little lever is for. Stick it in there and go, <coughs> ram it. Next shot. Okay, these are Minet bullets. It's a loaded cartridge and a fired round. In the 1840s, uh, various officers and various armies were working on ways of making <coughs> firearms more accurate. Everybody knew what a rifle was. It had come out in the 1500s. But making a rifle that you didn't have to pound the bullet down the board was a little more difficult. Smooth bores were popular because they were fast to load. And firepower became everything, not accuracy. Rifling, of course, here is grooves that are cut in the inside of the barrel. And they produced a gyroscopic spin on the bullet, making it much more stable in flight. Uh, Claude Manet, a captain in the French Army, uh, developed this hollow-based bullet. So they knew what bullets were, but he invented the idea of putting a hollow base cast into it, which um, when you dropped it down the bore, it could be undersized. When the powder expanded, exploded, when it, it uh, ignited, it would blow open the skirts of the lead, the soft lead. It would fill the rifling, and you'd have accuracy. Now this is a Model 1858 Musket Tune, uh, the Enfield style. Enfield, the uh, British gun-making uh, arsenal. Uh, started making rifled muskets in 1850, and then, then they produced their famous 1853 Enfield rifled musket. This is sort of the shorter version, and it's a lot easier to drag around here. So that's why I've got that. But these were very, very popular in the American Civil War. The Americans also made a version of their Springfield. The Confederates used lots of these. The Union actually used just as many. But they were still using the tactics of the smooth bore, where you had 100 to, well, 50 to 100 yard accuracy, using rifles now, and gee, we can shoot people at 500 yards. And so when you march up waiting to shoot at somebody at 50 yards, and they start shooting at you at 500 yards, it makes for awkwardness. And, <laughs> and so 
you ended up with a, a very, very high casualty rate. Uh, the bullets were big, they're fairly slow. There's plenty of references to guys carrying a Bible in their pocket, a red pocket, being hit by the bullet and getting knocked over, getting the, the uh, wind knocked out of their lungs, but surviving. And they, they attributed that to their, their piety in carrying a Bible. But there are other guys who carry a deck of cards and get the exact same thing. <laughs> so anyway, let's see. Uh, now, Colt was always trying to improve things. Everybody liked the Navy Colt. This is a great gun, but could you make it a little more powerful? But not quite as big as that big dragoon. So he came up with his Army Model of 1860, which was probably the paramount, the ultimate cap lock revolving pistol. He had this really cool, smooth lines, uh, had a ratchet um, uh, for the uh, loading lever, and he had um, he used the Navy frame, but expanded the cylinder just a little bit to accommodate the 44 caliber size. Used better seals too. So instead of a four pound, two ounce, you had a two pound, six ounce. Okay. And this was, would have been, this is basically the, the standard handgun of the, of the Union Army during the Civil War. Not the, but one of the, I should say. <coughs> Both had an editor in Elisha Remington and Sons. They came up with the idea of a solid frame. Actually, the British did. There's a guy named uh, Adams came up with a solid frame. But Remington sold it because that wasn't patented. And it made a much stronger gun. And a lot of people at the time thought that the Remington was a better gun than the Colt, uh, mostly because of the solid frame. The Union Army decided they liked the Remington better, too, mostly because they cost $12.50 and the Colt was charging $25. Uh, so after about the end of 1863 or so, uh, the Union Army said, no, we're not playing any more of those Colts, we're buying Remington. But still plenty of people were purchasing the Colts. And the Colts made about, again, about 250,000 of those in between 1860 and 1873. Um, let's see. Breech loading was being used. Now this is a cap lock sharps rifle. It's a fairly early <coughs> breech loader as far as being serviceable goes. There were other ones earlier, but this is one of the ones to break the ground. And by pushing down the lever, you open up the breech and allow a paper cartridge to be pushed in there. When you close the breech, it would shear off the end of that paper cartridge, exposing the powder. Then you would put this percussion cap, like they don't have one there. Uh, it's just a little top hat you know, at a top of with uh, fulminate of mercury, which is a very high explosive, on the end of it, and then you can shoot. Now, there's still gas flying all over the place, but it was an effective, accurate, fast-loading rifle. And that was the standard carbine for the Union uh, during the Civil War. And uh, it basically gave the Union quite a bit of firepower. Um, let's see, where are we going to next? I will go on to... What's the effective range on the sharps? On, a, on a, uh, the cap lock sharps? Effective range? Well, I don't know, no more than 500 yards. Um, you could probably, might be able to get something further away. There, I mean, they had ones with big scopes and stuff on them. They were pretty accurate, but you're still limited to, you know, to a certain degree. Now, in the 1850s, the French, and a lot of inventions actually came out of France. They can't be disciplined too bad. Okay, next one. Oh no, these guys, I wanted to show you these guys first. They're carrying Enfield rifle, that's our Enfield rifle, and those are Enfield rifle muskets. They look like a bunch of, uh, a bunch of Confederates. Those are actually Royal Engineers in Canada, up in British Columbia, part of the uh, Columbia Detachment. And they were sent armed to the teeth to deal with American miners on the Fraser River. Uh, because there was a strong sentiment amongst the miners that, hey, this should be part of the United States. And the Queen's government thought not. And so they sent a bunch of engineers to build a road. Uh, <laughs> 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 I wonder what they were paving it with. Yeah, exactly. And so this guy, Ned McGowan, Ned McGowan's war, 
who ha actually happened to be one of the causes for the Vigilance Committee in San Francisco, too. Uh, he was a nefarious individual. Um, anyway, he caused some of this stuff. Hey, he's an interesting guy. Okay, next up. Oh, there's a shark. Buffalo Hunters. Uh, this one's in its carbine guise, and probably straight from the uh, Union Army to the Buffalo Range. The Sharps was not the most common, but one of the most common weapons used in the Buffalo Range in the post-Civil War era. Uh, they were heavy caliber and very easy to convert to cartridge, which we'll get to in a second. Next. There we go. Pinfire. This is one of the earliest self-contained cartridges. And this little gun here is an <laughs> example of it. 1854, the French, uh, French army adopted a double action, which means that just one pull of the trigger does the job, uh, cartridge loading revolver. And the way they did it was that you have this pin, which hits your percussion cap, inside the cartridge. Um, it's a very effective method, uh, and the only reason it didn't come, become really popular is because it's kind of awkward having that pin, because if you've got a bunch of cartridges in a belt or something and something smacks it, then... <laughs> okay, next one. Oh, that is the needle fire. Uh, the Germans adopted a bolt-action breech-loading rifle in 1842. This happens to be the French version that they copied and improved, but the, the war between Prussia and the other German states and France in 1870 was fought with these breech-loading um, needle fire guns. It's a, it's a self-contained paper cartridge uh, that has the percussion cap behind the bullet inside the powder, inside the powder charge. And this long needle would go inside and hit it and boom. The trouble was they had to have this rubber and suet and all kinds of nasty stuff um, uh, O-ring to try to keep the gases from popping out. But anyway, they're bolt actions as early as 1842. Next. Okay, cartridge. The Civil War had shown that breech loading was the way to go. And even, even the British figured this out. They'd used the sharks, they liked it. They'd used a thing called a monkey tail, which also used a paper cartridge. But in 1866, 67, they adopted the Snyder, invented by an American, uh, breech loading carbine and rifle. And it opens sideways like that. And ejected by having a hell of a lot more grease on it, um, pops out the cartridge. The cartridge was made very much like a modern shotgun shell in that it has a separate base, paper wrapped uh, tube, and then they poured in the powder and they used the standard mini ball, the same exact bullet that they used in, the, in their uh, infield rifles. And you can maybe see a little similarity. They just sort of updated the infield and converted them to cartridge. Later on they made them from scratch this way, but the vast number originally were converted from muzzleloader. The United States had the same problem of having lots and lots of perfectly good muzzleloaders at the end of the Civil War, but they needed to update to something modern. So the head of uh, Springfield Armory, a guy named Erskine Allen, came up with an idea very similar, uh, which is called the trap door, which often that way instead of sideways. Uh, the Model 1865, which was a big rim fire, we'll get into that round 58, they just straight converted. Uh, 1866, they started lining the bores from 58 caliber to 50 caliber and uh, converting them. And then in 1873, they had decided that a 45 caliber bullet was much more accurate and had better range than the 50 caliber. So they went into 4570, which is what this one is. And this is approximately the same gun as Custer. Custer's guys carried into battle. But it's a very serviceable little cartridge. This is empty, by the way. <laughs> you load it like that, fire it, and pop your next one in. The problem was that 
as all go governments at the time were very parsimonious, nowadays they aren't, but nowadays they were. <laughs> um, they, you could make cartridges out of brass, but they didn't. They made them out of copper. And guys carried them in cartridge belts, but they made them themselves, and they made them out of leather and copper and leather, especially poorly tanned leather, tends to form stuff called verdigris. And verdigris, when it, it comes between a the cartridge and the, the chamber of the rifle, under a lot of pressure, like say from the powder and gas is expanding, uh, it forms sort of like cement, concrete. <laughs> and the nice sharp little ejector thing there would cut right through the rim of the of the copper cartridges. Where's that? Where's my copper cartridge. Come here. Here's the copper. So it cut right through the rim. And so at the Custer battlefield, they found lots of carbines with a cartridge still in it, cut through. And the guy, well, he may not have his knife anymore, but they found some broken knives. Guys were trying to dig out the cartridge any way they could, because, gee, get that thing crammed in there and locked. Well, you don't have a rifle to shoot anymore. And when there's howling savages, as they call them, uh, it, well, it was awkward. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next, let's see what's going on. Okay, there's the insides of a Snyder cartridge. Uh, you can see it's, it's a hollow point. They didn't design them just to expand like that. That was just actually to, for part of the um, uh, aerodynamics. But you can see they've got, you have your primer here. And it was just filled with like fiber, and then your gunpowder, uh, another wad, and then it would blast forth your uh, your bullet. Next. <laughs> oh yeah. Rocket ball. The um, this is an interesting little cartridge that came out with the very first lever action. Uh, Guys named Smith and Wesson patented a little thing, a little lever action carbine and pistol called the ball cannon. And it, it, it sort of suffered from a very poor cartridge. And this is basically a mini ball with gunpowder and a primer. And that was it. There was no cartridge, no nothing, just a little lead bullet that was hollowed out. There was a very cool idea, the, the uh, lever action, but it sort of suffered from a very underpowered cartridge. Next. Now. Smith and Wesson went on to design something else. It's called the rimfire cartridge. It's a brass case or copper case in which the priming is in the edges. And anywhere around that rim, there's priming. So wherever the firing pin hits, boom, it's going to set it off. Um, <clears throat> Smith and Wesson actually invented the 22. And every 22. You know, a modern 22 short round is exactly like the one Smith and Wesson built, except nowadays they use smokeless power. Other than that, it's the same thing. And they made revolvers. Guys carried them in the Civil War as personal defense. These little tiny 22 revolvers. You go, oh my God, why would they do that? I don't know. <laughs> but <clears throat> a guy named Oliver Winchester bought volcanic arms, and he had the a guy working for him named B. Tyler Henry, Benjamin Tyler Henry, who took the Smith & Wesson, two of their Smith & Wesson designs of the lever action and the rimfire cartridge, made the rimfire a 44, made the, the rifle much bigger, and turned it into the Henry rifle, Model 1860. Now this is it's a wild way to load it. Uh, <clears throat> it's a breech loader, but you load it from the front. And you would drop your cartridges in the front and drop it down. Now, you might immediately foresee some of the problem if your hand is in front here. You could be going like this and then, okay. oh yeah. <laughs> but there were very popular private purchase guns in the Civil War. There's a lot of references to guys who bought their own or regiments who bought their own. There's a famous picture of the 7th Illinois Infantry and their color guard. All of them armed with these 16 shooters. The Confederates said they were, you know, the gun you can load on Sunday and shoot all week. <coughs> if you're only firing twice a day. <laughs> uh, but it, 
it uh, ushered in the day of the repeating rifle. Now there's another guy out there, not just B. Tyler Henry, who was making, who designed a repeating rifle. Fortunately, I don't have one in hand, but it, they looked a hell of a lot like a sharp. So I'll use this. A guy named Christopher Spencer, and a Colt was the first thing from Christopher Spencer was the second and the best. Christopher Spencer was driving a car to work in the 1860s. Okay, he built a steam-powered car in his garage. It would have been steel. And he drove it to work in Hartford, Connecticut, until the city father said, you're scaring the horses, can you leave it at home, please? <laughs> <laughs> but he designed the rifle. The, it had a tube magazine, just like the Henry, but the magazine was in the butt. It was bored out, and you pulled the thing out of the, of the butt, dropped in seven rounds, a big 56 caliber rimfire rounds, and by operating the lever, ran cartridges through it. Now, it still had a separate hammer. You had the cock for each shot. But it was a lot sturdier than the Henry and became one of the standard arms of the Confederate, oh, pardon me, of the Union Army during the Civil War. The, in fact, the Confederates, when they first came up against these Spencer rifles, they were accusing the Union of executing soldiers. Because there's one famous incident in which there were like 20 Confederate soldiers who were dead behind a log, an oak log, and they're all shot right in the forehead. And the Indian, or the Confederates accused the Union of having executed them. And it turned out, no, the, the Union cavalry fired a volley, the Confederates jumped up, <laughs> and charged them, boom, they fired another volley like that. <laughs> Ooh, maybe we can't do that. <laughs> OK. Now, with these repeating rifles and breech loaders, this put a lot of interesting stuff into the game as far as the Indians were concerned, too. Although Custer, it didn't turn out so well for him. Uh, in 1867, the first of these Springfield trapdoor rifles were sent to the west and went to Montana. And there, were two fam there was a famous fight called Massacre, the Federal Massacre, which happened in 1866, <clears throat> in which <clears throat> Cavalry armed with single shot rifles, breech loaded carbines, and infantry armed with muzzle loaders were wiped out to the man by the suit, uh, by Red Cloud's suit. Uh, well, that summer, they started issuing the new breech loading rifles, and two different fights the Hayfield fight and the Wagon Box fight. The Indians surrounded the soldiers who were out actually heading hay. <coughs> for their horses, the cavalry horses for the winter. Uh, and these guys jumped behind the wagons, pulled, they pulled the boxes off of the, the, the wagon frame chassis yeah. and hid behind them and shot at the Indians. Well, the Indians, they, they fired a volley. Boom! The Indians charged. Boom! There's another volley. There's another volley. And the Indians said, well, wait a minute. You're not supposed to do this. Uh, you're supposed to wait a little while between shots. And so it was, uh, one with, it, anyway, it, it, uh, it put a whole different dimension in, into the game. There was one story I read from the 1850s, though, which showed some of the interesting concepts that went on. <clears throat> 1858, I believe it was, Ash Creek in uh, Col Colorado. The cavalry actually went up against the uh, uh, Cheyenne. And the Cheyenne sent the week before making themselves proof against the white man's uh, bullets. So they were impervious to bullets. Okay, might have been. They formed themselves up into a line of, a formal line of battle to fight the cavalry, because the cavalry was going to charge in with their pistols and the carbines, and they were going to fight them man to man with their war clubs and things, uh, because they were impervious to bullets. So the general in charge, a guy named William Harney, saw this, and he gave the order. As everybody's standing there with their carbines out like this, sitting on their horses, he gives the order, sling carbines. Oh, okay. That's what this saddle is for, by the way. Oops. It's supposed to be up to this. So, sling carbines, drop carbines, draw a saber. And the Indian said, hey, wait a minute, man, we're not proof against that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
It went poorly for the Indians that time. Uh, but that also shows that sabers actually were used in combat in the West. Okay, so with rifles, they're using various forms of conversion to make them uh, to convert these muzzle loaders, which everybody has one, into serviceable breech loaders. Uh, with repeaters, they're pretty much restricted to these fairly light uh, rimfire ones. They couldn't make the rimfires as powerful as the uh, as the uh, bigger single shot uh, center fires because uh, just the construction. Why don't you go ahead? Oh, here's some Henry rifle cartridges, by the way. Uh, even today, if you buy a Winchester 22, it has an H in it for B. Tyler Henry. And so that's what the 44 Winchester, or 44 Henry rounds look like. That's the guts of a, of this is a 73 Winchester, but the Henry rifle had the same exact guts. And notice that little toggle, it's the same one that was used in a Maxim machine gun and a Luger. Okay, okay, here's the difference between the center fire and a rim fire. The rim fire, the rim contains the primer, the priming compound, and the center fire, there's a separate little cap that has the priming. They can make the, they construct, can construct the center fire cartridges much more strongly because of this. <coughs> and that's just another view showing the same kind of thing. Okay. Okay, I'll get into that in a second. So conversions. They converted rifles, they also converted pistols. Now this is a really cool little pistol. This is a Navy Colt, which belongs to Master Payne's wife. And um, her grandfather found this in a building in Alaska. Uh, kind of light caliber, it's a 38 long Colt. But what they did was they just took the Navy, took off the loading lever, put on a little ejector, cut the back of the cylinder off, and called it good. Could put a cartridge right in there. <clears throat> these were very, very popular in the West, the conversions. Because, again, a lot of people had these guns. They wanted to modernize them. Well, there's a way to do it. And so it was a very, very popular conversion. They called actually produced these well into the 1880s. They would do it for you, too. If you sent your cap and ball revolver to the Colt factory, they do a conversion for you, and uh, you know for a fairly nominal fee. However, there were other people who said, "Well, we can build these from scratch, guys." The British got involved again, and this is a, a what they call Royal Irish Constabulary, uh, the RIC by Webley. They also made their, the Adams revolver, and it's in 450, uh, 450 Boxer. Now, the way they would eject the cartridges from these is you get this cool little thing here, you pull it out. There we go. Swing it over and plunk out each round. Kind of slow. I mean it you can unload the bullets pretty fast, but unloading the cartridges takes a little longer. So one of the guys, one of the we had a Frenchman named McGavin who came up and oh, this is a, we could, we could, I like playing with mechanical things. And figured out you don't have to plunk them out one at a time. And he came up with this idea where you go, <laughs> <laughs> and all of them go cling, and then you have to sort of, it's kind of awkward to put them back in, but again, you know, it, uh, well, this one's made in half the end. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a Dallin Somerville. Now, Tom and George Custer had given an English gentleman a nice hunting tour of the plains in 1868, and he presented each one of them. George Custer got an RIC, Tom Custer got a uh, Gallant Somerville. And Tom Custer's is still around, he left it at home when he went off the Little Bighorn. Tom Custer was actually a captain, and one of the few guys to get two medals of honor. They actually had two medals of honor uh, in the Civil War. But George Custer carried his RICs to the Little Bighorn. And, uh, well, they didn't do any good. 
<laughs> okay. Where am I? We're Peter. <clears throat> First off, I'll talk about this is the improved Henry. Uh, that was generally what it was called with the uh, improved Henry, although it was the first one that Winchester actually put his name on. He decided after a while that if he owned the company, all the guns ought to be named after him. Anyway, so the model 1866 improved Henry with King's patent loading gate. Now remember with the Henry rifle, you had to plunk your bullets in from the front. Well, King, Nelson King, came up with the idea, well, gee, we can put them in the side here. And if it's going to be a breech loader here, it might as well be a breech loader in the magazine. And they sold a ton of these things. They made them from 1866 to 1898. I don't have the exact numbers, but it was, you know, over $500. Uh, guys as famous as, say, Billy the Kid were known to carry these. They used the exact same cartridge. They were using the 44 Henry cartridge, a rimfire. So they weren't real, real powerful. But they were still pretty, they were fast, they were relatively inexpensive, and Indians bought lots and lots of them. But we will get back to this one. This actually got an interesting history later on. More handguns. Where do I want to go repeat it again? Okay, more repeaters. <clears throat> Now Winchester decided, we're going to get into the centerfire uh, racket. And in 1873, they decided, well, we're going to put a, use an iron frame and use a centerfire cartridge. It became the 4440 cartridge. That means 44 caliber and used 40 grains of powder. The grain weight is the old English measurement. They're 7,000 to a pound, so you guys can figure it out. <clears throat> I'm not a mathematic geek. It was extremely popular. Uh, various countries adopted them <coughs> cavalry carbines. Um, Winchester sold thousands and thousands of them in the West. Guys used them as hunting rifles. Uh, nowadays they're considered a little bit light for a hunting rifle, but they didn't have so much qual many qualms about wounding animals and letting them run off in those days. Uh, and Billy the Kid definitely had one of these, the famous picture of him where everybody says, oh he's a left-handed gun. Well, they only made the loading gate on this side. And when you see the picture of him with the loading gate on this side and his gun on the left side, you go, oh, maybe they need to reverse the photo. <laughs> but the Winchester rifle is sort of iconic for the West, uh, 73. In 1876, Winchester decided, well, these aren't powerful enough. We're going to upgrade. And they made what they call the 76 Winchester, or the Centennial model. And they are huge. I mean, the, this part comes clear to there. They are enormous. The cartridge is called 4575. So 45 caliber, 75 grains of powder. So they definitely upped the ante. The 76 was carried by such guys as Teddy Roosevelt, which he carried when he was a ranchman in South Dakota. But also, the, uh, uh, the Royal Northwest, well, pardon me, the Northwest Mounted Police. That. Let's see where we are. Oh, that's the Martini Henry cartridge. We're going to have to come back to that. Ah, okay. uh, here's the good one. Uh, Winchester and Colt. Next one. More Winchesters. Same guns. Okay, here we go. This is a Charles Russell painting of a Mountie arresting a Blackfoot medicine man with his 76 Winchester. Riding into camp. This had really happened. Put his 76 Winchester carbine to the uh, Rose Man's head and said, you're coming with me. Okay. Um, the Mounties used them from 1879, 78, up until past 1900. They, just, they actually liked them better than the ones that replaced them, the, uh, the Lee Medfords, because they were actually more accurate at long range. Uh, they were really, really good gun. Okay, let's back up to that martini. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> Now, the big single shots were still <coughs> single shots because they're still, they can still make them more powerful than the repeaters. So most armies, for various reasons, went with single shot rifles to arm their troops with. One reason was they didn't want to shoot in all their ammo too fast. 
And in a, if you know, you start thinking about it, they were resupplying these guys with wagons pulled by horses. And the horses eat. And the logistics of moving wagons and horses and fodder and all this stuff becomes really, really incredible if you're shooting lots and lots of ammo. Elijah Remington, back to him, his company came up with this thing called the Rolling Block. And it uh, is very easy to operate, it's extremely strong, it's too basically a circle, and was adopted by virtually every country in the world that used some of them. This particular one is what they call an Egyptian rolling block. It was adopted by Egypt in 1870 or 71, and I think this was used at Om German in 1898 because this it's rugged. Uh, covered with with uh, Egyptian or pardon me, Arabic writing and it's pretty much a smooth bore now. <laughs> uh, but they were popular. The, um, they're popular on the Buffalo Range. They were popular uh, South America. Spain adopted in 1871 too. And virtually all of the former Spanish colonies also adopted the rolling blocks. And Remington was doing really, really, really big business in just having warehouses full of these guns. And somebody said in order, boom, they ship them out right now. So rolling blocks were, uh, there was the AK-47 of the 19th century. Now, haha, Britain got into it. How about it's an American design? Uh, Peabody, a guy named Peabody in New England, of course, came up with this design of a falling block. Drop the block, drop the lever, the block goes down, you can put in your cartridge. This is one of the cartridges. Um, they suffered from the same problem that we did with the copper cases, except they used a foil, wrapped brass foil, to make their cartridges, and they were soldered together by orphans of soldiers. That was how the, uh, the Victorian government did its uh, uh, social welfare. They would hire the orphans of soldiers who were killed in combat to, you know, pennies a day to build cartridges. <clears throat> Needless to say, the soldering jobs were not necessarily very good. At any rate, <clears throat> it was adopted in 1871, and for the Welsh Singing and Shooting Societies uh, of Africa, in other words, the uh, 24th Regiment of Foot in uh, San Luana and the Warwick Drift, this is what they used, and uh, they're very, very effective as long as you don't rip the head of the cartridge off and send it flying and go, oh, where's my knife? Now, not only did the British use these, oh, I want to bring in a, one nice little uh, local color. Some of these rifles were also issued to the Naval Brigade, actually, the Naval Brigade carried these rifles in the Zulu War. Many of the troops from the, in the Naval Brigade were from a HMS Shaw, like Shaw of Iran, from Iran. And uh, the HMS, pardon me, HMS Shaw, was the flagship of the British Pacific Squadron, which just so happened to be stationed at Esquimalt, which is like next door to Victoria. Uh, so they're actually, as far as we're concerned, local troops involved in the Zulu War. They also brought their Gatling guns, which is why they were really there. Uh, but at any event, and also HMS Shaw was the first ship to uh, fire a self-propelled torpedo in combat. Uh, they missed. Uh, but they were fighting, <laughs> they were fighting a, uh, a Peruvian rebel uh, ironclad ship that got away. <laughs> now, oh yeah, some more about, okay, wow, where'd you go? Okay, give me another couple of things here. Oh, where are we? oh okay, go back. I don't need that yet. Okay, now the Turks were very Anglo-centric in certain ways. And they said, we want to have the exact same rifle that the British do. And in 1874, that's what they adopted. Unfortunately, the British were pretty well at full capacity in building these. So they went to a place called Providence Tool Company in Providence, Rhode Island. <clears throat> and while the British called their version the Martini Henry, after a guy named Friedrich Martini, who modified the Peabody action, and Henry, who invented the rifling style, uh, the Turks called theirs the, Mar the Peabody Martini, but they were exactly the same. The writing is different on the side, other than that, they're the same gun. 
Now, in 1877, at the Battle of Plevna, the Turks, uh, an army of Turks, got themselves besieged by an army of Russians. Now, this is in Bulgaria. We tend to forget that there was a lot going on in the Balkans then, too. Uh, the uh, Turkish army, the Turkish general, um, Osman Pasha, uh, did some very, very good uh, laying out of his defenses. And he had all these trenches, and he also had men go out and put stakes at known yardages. Like, there's a thousand yards, there's a stake at 900 yards, 800 yards, etc., 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 and then a big stake at 100 yards. Now, the Russians, in their indomitable way, using steamroller attacks, because they got lots and lots of peasants, they would they charged up the hill to the Turkish defenses. Uh, the Turks opened up at 1,000 yards, actually might have been 1,200 yards, with their Peabody Martinis and started the slaughter. The Russians figured, reasonably, that we'll get real close and they, they're still working the action and some of them will be jammed and all this stuff and, and we'll be able to, to overwhelm them. Well, Turkish cavalry also happened to have gotten bottled up in Plevna. And so Osman Pasha took their carbines from, he should them to his infantry. So each infantryman had two guns. He had his Peabody Martini with about two or three hundred rounds. He also had a Winchester 66 carbine. <laughs> <laughs> and so at a hundred yards, when the Russians got to a hundred yards, they put down their martinis, picked up their Winchesters, and went, bah, 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 bah. Okay. And all the Europeans said, wow, that's a neat idea. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's like, well, duh. People had sort of suggested this before. Well, yeah, but nobody used it before, so we couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> so the Turks were the ones that introduced the whole concept of a magazine rifle for Europe in the form of the Winchester. Uh, the first country to adopt the magazine rifle as their standard infantry rifle was the Swiss. And their gun, other than being a bolt action, has the same basic little lifter inside that the Winchester does. It was a rimfire run, a 41 rimfire, as powerful as you can get a rimfire. But the rest of the Europeans looked at that and said, eh, we want a nice big heavy center fire. So, now, they liked bolt guns because the trouble with the lever action is if you're laying down prone, which is really handy when people are shooting at you. If you're laying down, this kind of gets in the way. You know, I mean, if your buttons are getting in the way, this thing's really going to get in the way. <laughs> so they went to bolt actions. And one of the earliest was a, it was adopted uh, in the 1870s. They were experimented with. Winchester came up with a thing with, uh, along with Benjamin Hotchkiss, uh, called the Winchester Hotchkiss, and they used a bolt action very simple style bolt action with, combined with the Spencer tube magazine. Okay, and they experimented with those. The Army did, the Navy adopted them. Uh, France, the French Navy, the navies adopt stuff before armies do for some reason. The French Navy adopted a thing called a Croquetic check. And it had an under the uh, tube, under the barrel tube magazine. <coughs> uh, later on, the Germans adopted their they took their well, 1871 single shot bolt action rifle, modified it with a under the uh, under the barrel tube magazine, just like a Winchester, called it a 70 Gewehr 7184. Actually, I mean, see, see. Uh, and that was considered that was absolute top of the line as far as everybody was concerned. However, in the 1870s, there was a guy by the name of James Paris Lee, and James Paris Lee was a Scotsman who had been born in Canada, naturalized American citizen. So it's still an American. Uh, he came up with another idea, melded with a bolt action. And he thought, well, gee, we don't need to put this bullet ball in two magazines or in the butt or something. Why don't we put one underneath? And in 1879, the US Navy adopted uh, and limited, limited numbers, the 1879 uh, Remington, actually it was a, a Sharps Lee, the first ones were made by Sharps Rifle Corporation. 1882, the U.S. Army adopted some for experimentation. 1885, the Navy adopted large numbers. 
Now, works just like a standard bolt action, except after you've fired your five rounds, let me pre-stage something here. Where did it go? So, after you've emptied your magazine, everybody else is still fumbling with, with uh, their individual cartridges trying to load, you're just putting in new magazines. Every single modern gun that uses a box magazine descends from this rifle. Uh, it was revolutionary, but nobody knew it. Uh, the standard thing of, wow, that's different. We don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so it took a while. But in 1880, well, as of 1879, the United States Navy was using a bolt action, detachable magazine, repeating rifle, 45 7 in the standard US caliber. And it took everybody else. Uh, well, the United States Army didn't adopt a rifle that took a detachable magazine as their standard infantry rifle until 1957. Okay. We used a lot of other guns in the meantime. As far as a detachable magazine, not till the M14. Okay, back to handguns, because there's lots of concurrent stuff going on here. Uh, now, Colt, of course, they decided they didn't want to just do their. Um, modified cap and ball revolvers. They stole the idea from Remington for, for a solid frame and came out with their famous Colt single action army revolver of 1873. This is actually the artillery model, which was the cavalry model bobbed down a little bit, but it became the standard Westerner's gun. I mean, this is the cowboy gun. One of the reasons for it being the standard cowboy gun Virtually every single gunfighter, uh, bad man, anything in the West had one exactly like this, down to the U.S. marking. Because about a quarter to a third of the U.S. Army in the, on the frontier, every springtime would desert, and they would take their guns with them and sell them. So these things were everywhere. Guys would bring their guns, they would go to the nearest farmer or whatever and sell everything they had, from their pants, jackets, guns. Uh, Johnny Ringo carried one of these. Doc Holliday had one of these. They're exactly the same gun. You see all this up on TV and in movies. Well, they've got their own special gun. No, they were seven and a half inch, 45 holes. <laughs> same thing. Now later on, shorter barrels became popular because when you're riding horseback, this is great. When you're trying to sit in a chair, that long barrel kind of gets in the way. So they got into shorter barrels. Oh yeah, that's one more. Like your barbecue gun. <laughs> you gotta have the cool one for, for going to your barbecue or for in town. However, Smith and Wesson actually got involved a little earlier in the cartridge. They, they, they actually held, held a patent for the board through cylinder. Now, you wouldn't think that a board through cylinder would be patentable because to make a cap and ball revolver, you still had to drill a hole all the way through. But for some reason, uh, the Roland White patent held until 1869. So Smith and Wesson held the patent, and everybody else had to sort of bite their time. But they came out with they called the Smith and Wesson American in 1870. Uh, it was a big 44 caliber. They used the 44 Henry cartridge as the basis. They turned it into a center fire, and that became the 44 American. Now, in 1871, the Russian Duke Princeling named Alexis came to the United States and went on a big buffalo hunt with the likes of Buffalo Bill Cody and George Custer and Wild Bill, yeah, Wild Bill Hickok was involved. Um, and a lot of those guys were using the Smith & Wesson America. And Alexis thought, wow, oh, that's pretty cool. He decided that the Russian Army was going to adopt them. And I don't know if he told anybody else, but that's what he decided. The neat thing about them was, boom, you could just not, you know, eject all your empty cartridges at once. And then it was open, so you could then plunk in your new ones. It was very, very fast, and became, <clears throat> the one that the Russians adopted became, guess what? A 44 Russian. <laughs> Smith and Wesson Russian. Uh, one of the captains in the uh, inspection team from Russia liked the spur on the trigger guard, so that's what they built. 
and they liked a little hump at the back. That's the way they built them. And they also became known as a target pistol. Why are we renowned as a target gun? Because they're very, very accurate. This particular one is actually called a new model. Came out in 1878, so it's like a little bit later, but essentially the same gun as the 1870 and 72 version. Now, what's cool about this particular pistol is it's 149 numbers off from the one that Virgil Earp carried at the Battle of the Chudad of the So it probably came out of the factory in the same week. Okay, same week. <laughs> <laughs> but the 44 Russian cartridge, which had a Instead of the cartridge being, the bullet being mostly on the outside of the cartridge, the Russians said no, make it on the inside because the extremes of weather, we don't want all the grease and the grooves on the outside melting and stuff. So that made American gun makers go, hey, this is not a bad idea. And the 44 Russian cartridge became the basis for most modern American cartridges. Uh, it's especially the basis uh, for the 44 Special and the 44 Magnum. So if you want to, you can shoot a 44 Russian cartridge in a modern 44 American, uh, 44 Magnum. It's the same exact cartridge, just a whole lot shorter. The reason they made the 44 Magnum longer, so some idiot couldn't just put one in one of these and go, blue. <laughs> it's really awkward to do that. <laughs> you ruin some expensive guns. Now, it's oh, only halfway. Oh, cool. Well, more than half. More than half. Okay. The as the frontier became tame, <coughs> various municipalities made rules about carrying guns. <coughs> they didn't care for the fact that people were carrying guns openly all the time. They thought it led to violence. Um, it was probably illegal if they did that. However, they were the ones enforcing the law, so they got to do it. Outfits like Smith & Wesson, Colt, a host of others made a lot of pocket pistols. This is called a baby Russian. I wonder why. Uh, works exactly the same way. And Smith & Wesson developed a little 38 cartridge to go with it. 38 Smith & Wesson. Amazing. But these were enormously popular because Man, most people, I got a lot of crap on <laughs> most, most guys carried a gun. They didn't carry it openly anymore because it was frowned upon by the finer sorts. They still carried a gun. And so these pocket pistols became and remain far, far more common than the bigger holster guns. Uh, every Western holster gun you find, there's probably a dozen of these. And they made them real cheap, too. A lot of them, the Wessons and Colts were well made. They made a lot of them in 22, and the collector term for them is suicide special. <laughs> so, you know, save it from there. Okay, let's see where we're at. Improved repeating rifle. We talked about those. Ah, <clears throat> now, one of the heights of the black powder cartridge rifle, military rifle, is the Remington Lee. <clears throat> However, those pesky Frenchmen had been doing a lot of experimentation. One of the problems with black powder is that it makes a lot of smoke. I mean, if you've ever been to like a Civil War reenactment, and after a while, you, neither side can see the other guy. Okay? And that's probably why smooth boards were considered perfectly legitimate for a long time, because, well, you can't see them anyway. Um, <laughs> but that is, again, a reason why Red was popular, and more than just the British used red, in fact, uh, as a uniform color. So you can actually see who is on your side, um, the uh, you know through the clouds of smoke. So these French chemists working uh, at the at the uh, official armory at Saint Etienne developed a nitrocellulose smokeless powder. Now chemically, they did basically they took the three primary components of black powder, which is sulfur, uh, saltpeter, which is potassium nitrate, and charcoal, uh, and they brought it down to its constituent uh, chemical basis. And that they produced a smokeless powder. Now, they, in 1886, they introduced their Lobel rifles. 
It was a very pedestrian design. It was a tube magazine, I mean, under the barrel tube magazine, bolt action rifle. It wasn't any different, really, from the German 7184, two years earlier. They could have had a detachable magazine, but they didn't want to go that way. Um, they used this rifle through World War I. And, <clears throat> but the cartridge itself was absolutely revolutionary. Because all of these were actually started the arms race, the, the arms race that led to World War I. But the French really put some interesting stuff in the game with their introduction of nitrocellulose powder. Now the British wanted to get involved too. They uh, did some experimentation. They actually adopted the Lee system, the detachable magazine. Um, they turned it into a small bore. Now, that was one thing that the French did too with their smokeless powder is they went from an 11 millimeter, about 43 caliber, down to an 8 millimeter, about a 32 caliber. They took their 11 millimeter cartridge and just necked it down. The British, <coughs> well, the the Swiss got involved too, and they developed a 7.5 millimeter. The British said, hey, we like that idea, but we want to keep these big ugly rims on our cartridges, so they developed the 303, melted it with the Lee action, and a guy named Medford invented a certain set of rifling, and they adopted that as the Lee Medford of 1888. They didn't have the technology to make smokeless powder yet, though, so they made it with black powder. But the 303 cartridge was originally a black powder cartridge, and they figured, you know, it's better to get in on this magazine stuff now and we'll deal with the uh, smokeless powder later than to get caught with our, our vast holdings all over the world and not having magazine rifles. So actually, they started to become forward thinking. Uh, let's see what's next. Oh, yeah, there we go. <coughs> right out of room over there. The Germans. Decided to upgrade too. Now this is slightly modified from World War One years, but they adopted in 1888 a rifle that was not for the first time for a while. Uh, a product was Peter Paul Mauser. It was, a, invented, it was developed by a commission, and like they say, a commission. Let's see, you know, a camel is a horse designed by a commission or a committee. It's a good idea, but they took a basic Mauser bolt and they added to it a Mannlicher clip. Now this is the Mannlicher clip. Uh, a guy named Mannlicher, an, an Austrian, developed a steel, spring steel clip that would hold a number of cartridges, usually five, in place while you loaded the whole thing into your magazine well. And as you fired, the cartridges would be pushed up by a spring inside and then the, mag the uh, clip would fall out the bottom. It's called the end block clip. It's the exact same thing we used in the M1 Garand in World War II in Korea. So it's a really good design. The problem is that it left a big hole, just as actually covered, at the bottom of your rifle, right where you really don't want a lot of mud. And when you're going plop right in the mud, it gets a lot of gunk in there. So Mauser got back into the works and developed a thing called a uh, stripper clip. Next. This is actually a British charger, but you can see you've got a clip that holds a number of cartridges together, and rather than inserting the entire thing, you strip the cartridges out into the magazine. Uh, if uh, Mauser started making them in 1889, uh, some of them in Belgium and Chile. This happens to be a Model 1896 Swede. Sweden adopted it, uh, 6.5 by 55 millimeter. Uh, 1891, a very similar rifle was adopted by Spain, and with it, uh, they kicked our butts in Cuba. The, you know, we get all the information, you know, the, the glories of the Rough Riders charging up San Juan Hill, which actually we have that picture. There we go, charging up San Juan Hill. There's Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and the Americans had this very substandard uh, design called the Craig that had the magazine off the side and you had to individually put your cartridges in. Well, the Spaniards are using these charger loaded Mausers, 7 millimeter Mausers. And um, 
we just we we pulled a Russian on them and we overwhelmed them. But this became the basis for virtually all uh, infantry weapons from 1900 to through World War II. Let's see what's next. Okay. Want me to back up? Nah. <laughs> now the Russians got in on the game. You know, there's a lot of Russian stuff. They adopted a design that's it's kind of pedestrian, but it is rugged. And sometimes you have to use a two by four to open it up. In, 18, in 1891, they adopted their rules in Nagant. And they used this through the 50s. It's a very, very, again, it's clunky, but serviceable. They're very, very accurate. But you can use these darn things no matter what the temperature is, whether it's 120 degrees above or below zero. And they use ammunition that's been buried under some farmer's barn for 30 years, and they work just fine. <laughs> As I mentioned, the British adopted the Lee action uh, in 1903, 1902, after their experiences in the Boer War, they decided, well, gee, carbines don't have the range we need for cavalry. Rifles are a bit too long and clunky to be carried on cavalry. And we think that because of our experiences in the Boer War, that's how wars are going to be in the future, chasing around on horseback all over the place. So they adopted the SMLE, the Smelly. Short, now it's not a short magazine, it's short. It carries a magazine. And it's a Lee Enfield. Now, the same guy, Medford, developed the rifling as on an Enfield as for a Medford, but they took, they called it an Enfield anyway. Now, this is a, a bit of an improvement over the American Lee, Re Lee Remington, in that it's got a 10 round magazine, but it also takes a charger. Now, you'll notice there's a little hole here, a little stud. The early magazines on Lee Medford's and Lee Enfield's had a loop at the bottom of the magazine and a chain. They were afraid that the soldiers were going to lose their magazine. They didn't issue spare. So it's like, well, why the hell do you have a casual magazine if you're not going to issue it? But, you know, that's the British Army. <laughs> but it has some distinct advantages over the Mauser system in that the locking lugs. Okay, so they all have to lock to make sure that the bolt doesn't come all the way back into your nose. Uh, they're on the back, not way up inside, as on a Mauser. And they discovered, gee, in the trenches, this is a handy thing to be able to clean your rifle with just doing this. Actually, that's the standard thing. Here's the, the Tommy who's cleaning and oiling his rifle, and the Scots trooper, he's just oiling his bayonet. <laughs> what? There's a trigger on this? <laughs> now, the United States in 1903, well, actually, after their experiences in the Spanish American War, decided their Krang rifles and carbines were not as good as the Mauser. And they adopted the 1903 Springfield. Um, it's a Mauser action. But we had to pay Mauser a royalty $200,000 for stealing his ideas. Uh, and we modified it a little bit, not all of them were good, but they certainly all, it was, it was, it was a good design. Uh, it's one of the most accurate rifles ever to be produced, and was our standard rifle uh, from 1903 into, through, into World War II. They didn't make enough of the semi-automatic rams to arm everybody with, so plenty of guys were carrying these in World War II. Um, just a five shot, 30-06 was developed for this <coughs> rifle. And uh, we also took the same lessons that the British had learned about a short rifle and adopted that so that all branches of the service, whether they were infantry, cavalry, artillery, whatever, carried the same rifle. So they're a little longer and heavier than a cavalry carbine, but a lot lighter and shorter than an infantry rifle. And advanced uh, improvements in uh, and the smokeless powder technology also helped in being able to use shorter barrels so they burned quicker. The Germans were not altogether behind the time. In 1898, the 
Okay, it's 98 Mazda was introduced. Nice long one, but in 1904, the Germans got on the bandwagon and started producing their K98. A. Carby. And uh, this is the actually this is the post-World War II version. Produced for a long, long time. But effectively, in World War I and early World War II, the Americans and the British and the Germans were using very, very, very similar rifles. Short rifles, shooting very powerful, center fire smokeless cartridge. But it wasn't just the military that was getting involved in this. Winchester was not far behind, and they took the, uh, had a designer, a guy by the, uh, nice little Mormon boy, by the name of John Moses Browning in uh, Utah. <laughs> they asked him to design a smokeless rifle, and it had to be very strong, and he came up with their, became the 94 Winchester, the 30-30. It's a very strong action, and they've made like 8 million of the things since 18, since 94. They actually went out of production for a while, they're back in production. Uh, <clears throat> the standard deer gun, deer rifle for literally millions of people for over a century. But that's the first civilian smokeless rifle, the 3030. And these were used, I mean, I got in the, Me in the Mexican Revolution, this was pretty, that, a 7 millimeter Mauser or a 30-30 was standard. 30-30 isn't real powerful. I mean, it's powerful about the same power as the AK-47 round, 7.62 by 39. Great for deer, but it doesn't have a huge lot of range. So Browning went back to the drawing board and designed a rifle around the 30-40 US cartridge, which was designed for the Craig, which is also strong enough for the 30-06. And in 1895, they came up with their 95 Winchester. They're very uh, inventive with their names. Anyway, it's got a box magazine on the inside, which you have to load one by one. But I like it, it's sort of like a box car in a couple of them. Now, back to the Russians. And during World War I, the Russians didn't have enough rifles for all their troops. So they sent out people on buying expeditions. And one of the Russian officers went to Winchester and said, wow, I really like that gun. And so they ended up ordering like 300,000 95 Winchesters designed for the Russian cartridge 762x54R, which was for their most of the guns. And they also had a the stripper, the charger, stripper clip guide built on. So actually most of the 95 Winchesters made were for the Russian contract. Okay, back to pistols for a minute. Established that a solid <coughs> frame was a good thing. The Smith and Wessons broke open. Really, I mean, they're a really good, efficient gun. But the problem is they're kind of weak here. And when you hit somebody over the head with it, it puts it out of order. And so people wanted something stronger. So in 1888, Colt came out with a revolver adopted by the U.S. Navy, of course. <laughs> That was the swing out cylinder. You'd swing it out, plunk out all your rounds, but it still had a solid frame. So when you hit people on the head, it didn't bend. Uh, they'd done experiments, and as all experimenters are wont to do, they ignored field, you know, reports from the field, and they thought a 38 was just dandy. And the, doc the Army in 1892 adopted a modified version. This is the Army version model, 1892. And in, uh, in the war with Spain, in Cuba, and in Puerto Rico, they work just dandy. When you shoot a Spaniard or any other European, they scream, and they go down, and they cry for a minute. Unfortunately, as part of that war, Teddy Roosevelt sent uh, a naval expedition off to Manila, and because he thought we should be an imperialist country, and we captured the Philippines. Not all the Filipinos thought this was a good idea. <laughs> so, 
we discovered the shortcomings of the 38 caliber round, um, especially the, um, let's see, the Muslim extremists in the southern Philippines who don't go down when you shoot them with a 9, I'm a 38 revolver. Okay. Uh, what have we seen this? But it still was a really good design. But, you know, you've put six rounds into somebody's heart and he still comes up and chops your head off before he dies, and that, eh, not a good idea. <laughs> the army, or army ordinance said, oh, well, that's because it's not accurate enough. So they redesigned the cartridge, eventually they came up with the 38 Special. It's a very accurate round. A little bit more powerful than the 38 Long Colt. It still doesn't do the job when you got somebody that's hopped up and really intent on cutting your head off. So, Colt said, oh, we can make a bigger one. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the new service model of 1898. Um, it's a, it's big. Uh, this is the seven and a half inch model. Uh, and a lot of, the Army actually didn't adopt it until, eight, until 1909. They bought a bunch of them, but they didn't actually adopt it, start issuing it until 1909. But it's in the standard 45 Colt that the old single actions have been in. In the meantime, after discovering that their 38s weren't working so well, they pulled out a story in a bunch of their old Model 1873 single actions and whacked off the barrels because sitting in, you know, I mean, long barrels are awkward. Um, they started issuing these out. And you may only have six shots, but by God, those six shots work. <laughs> and in fact, there was one uh, uh, Moro, Morisco, uh, that bandit uh, who absorbed something like 20 rounds from the rifles, the cracked rifles, and wasn't put down until a sergeant shot him in the head with a 45. Well, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> now, revolvers are going to talk to I wanted to also mention, the British thought that the break open was a sound idea. And actually, about the time the Americans were discarding the, the break open. The British adopted it with their Webley, starting in 1887. And they used the Webley break open from 455 and later to 38 uh, up through 1957. So it's a serviceable idea. Famous person carried a What famous person carried a weapon? Oh, yeah, Watson. Throw me over me. But it was an RIC. <laughs> it was one of these. Who did carry in Afghanistan? All right. Now, there are other people working on things at the same time. There was, I mentioned Hiram Maxim. Hiram Maxim had, in, he wanted to get in, he was a tinkerer, and he thought, wow, I could make a lot of money with all these ideas I have. And somebody said, hey, you know, the Europeans are trying to kill each other by the bushel basket. Why don't you go there and try to sell some guns? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he went to Europe, he invented his Maxim machine gun. What's cool is that the first fully auto automatic weapon was the Winchester 73. He took a 73 Winchester, cut the end of the barrel off, put a rod in there, and another rod operating the action. So when you pull the trigger, this block on the end of the barrel went forward, operated this, and it had a spring to pull it back. So you can turn one of these into a full auto if you really, really want to. <laughs> 20 years and $20,000. <laughs> but he proved that it worked. And remember I showed you that photograph of the uh, link, the little toggle link inside of Winchester. That's what he used inside his machine gun. So the Maxim machine gun, which is also a Vickers machine gun, which the British, the Germans, the Russians, and about everybody else in the world used in World War I to slaughter each other with, each other with is basically a Winchester. Um, but other people took the same idea of, gee, we can use the gases and the power of the cartridge to do something other than bruise our shoulders. And <clears throat> Mauser said, hey, that's a neat idea. And they came up with a pistol. Now this one is really nifty because it's got a Anyway, so you've got, sorry about that, you've got a nice little holster that turns into your shoulder stock. <coughs> but the Mauser broom handle, gee, yeah, I wonder why they call it a broom handle, was a very popular gun. It came out in 1896 in a 30 caliber bottleneck cartridge. 
Uh, it was actually very, very powerful. The, uh, the Russians adopted that cartridge and used it uh, well into the 1950s because it would punch through heavy overcoats. Most of the Russian guns were designed for shooting people in the back of the head. This one actually was <laughs> <laughs> Now, they're kind of awkward looking, but they're actually very comfortable to fire. And the British officers thought these were the coolest thing in the world. Come across a number of pictures of British officers in the late 1890s and the early 1900s carrying these Mauser broom hands. Uh, one of the most famous officers to carry one in battle was Winston Churchill. Churchill carried one of these at the Battle of Omdurman, the same one that this rifle probably was at, uh, in 1898. The, uh, it has 10 rounds, which is really handy when everybody else has six. And again, it's a very powerful, very fast operating gun. All you do is pull a trigger. Tung, tung, tung. Now, Mauser actually, also because they had a pattern, they uh, adopted it to use their so this one's actually a nine millimeter. These are these are not these. Um, but you just push those in there, and it's ready to go. Anyway, so it was a very very popular round, very popular design. Now about the same time, a guy named Hugo Borchardt. Well, you need to back up a couple. Oh, that was a Shaw. Back up. Okay, that's HMS Shaw, the one that fired the torpedo. Okay. Welcome back. <laughs> okay. No, that's the one. That's a Borchardt, invented by a German American named Hugo Borchardt. His first invention was actually a Sharps rifle, the, the Borchardt, Sharps Borchardt of 1878. He went back to Germany and came up with this using the toggle action of the Winchester to make it work. That's big, clunky, uh, and used a very used basically a similar cartridge to the Mauser, but it wasn't quite as powerful. Now that got morphed. Now, company, the Irma Berger, they sent it off to a young designer named uh, George Luger. And Gerhard Luger said, hey, I can do something with that. He spent a lot of time in the United States, obviously. He knew what he was doing. Um, in 1899, came up with the Luger. This happens to be a German naval Luger. Hoggle action. It's like a Winchester. Uh, this one is model 1904. P04? Uh, uh, introduced the 9mm cartridge, which is used by everybody today, including the United States. And again, people were really into the cold pistol carbine. Thing. But so it's sort of a evolutionary blind alley, but a really, really cool evolutionary blind alley. So the Mauser was the standard, pardon me, the Luger was the standard German army pistol uh, <clears throat> up until 1938, and still a substitute standard through the end of the war. And it's just it's a collectible. Everybody loves them because they just feel neat and they're just a, a really cool gun. Uh, anyway, I'll give it back. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm done with those kind of guns. Let's move to. Oh, wait a minute. I'm done. I've still got one. Uh, okay. Colt got into the whole automatic, semi automatic gun deal uh, with, again, uh, uh, John Moses Browning. And this is the model 1900. His first one built from scratch, and put a clip in. Again, it's got your, we have the, uh, the Lee type detachable magazine. And you put a clip in and went Bruh! What the hell? Um, there's, you have to have a thing called a disconnector in these things to make them work. <laughs> boom, 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 is that rah. It's a lot easier to make a full auto, actually. <laughs> you, didn't, I, you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> But the model 1900 is a 38. And it's a really nice, comfortable little gun. Has the same exact shortcomings as that 38 revolver. In that, gee, you can empty it into somebody, and if they're really, really, really interested in hurting you, they still will. But the Army was very intrigued. And while they used these for a few years, 
They said, we want something bigger. Colt, can you design something a little bigger and a little sturdier? They did. And in 1911, they came up with the 1911 Colt automatic pistol, which up until 1984 was a standard U.S. Army handgun. And this one happened to be made in 1914. That's a good, you know, chasing Pancho Villa kind of guy. But <clears throat> basically, by the turn of the century, everything that they used today had been developed. It, it was in use in some way or another. Uh, whether it's in the 1911 with the 45 automatic cartridge, <clears throat> the 9 millimeter cartridge, <clears throat> the 30 Mauser, Coca-Cola Red, it was all in. All. <clears throat> now, one thing I didn't talk about much was shotguns. Okay, so we can use, yeah, there's a shot cartridge. Now, I talked about muzzle loading shotguns, but obviously, when everybody else got on the bandwagon for uh, breech loading, they did that with shotguns too. Now, this is pretty much the classic Western sheriff's gun. Really, really good reason. The old, you know, drop them pistols that will cut you off at the pockets. Uh, now this is a 12 bore rather than the 10s were probably, there we go, nice brass shell. The 10s were 12 bore. Good, it'll fit. <laughs> so, a lot of them were made in brass, but they also made a lot in paper with a short base, brass base. Uh, <clears throat> it was a very popular thing. The, anyway, Shotguns are really, really versatile. You can use small shot, buckshot, or you can use solid ball, too. You know, full-size 72 caliber round ball, too. Now, this particular one, made by Baker, or designed by Baker, which later you can't get the cut. You notice you, most of them have a thing on the back here to open it up, and this one doesn't. Push that trigger forward. Wow. Well, kind of cool. But you can look at Talk them both at once. Anyway, it's pretty cool. But hammers can be a little awkward. Some people want them faster than that. So by the 18, late 1870s, early 80s, they developed a hammerless. You could have the internal lock work on your rifle, or your shotgun rather. And this was basically the basis for a lot of British double rifles too. Uh, not only were shotguns made uh, double format, but rifles, heavy, heavy caliber rifles, like 600 Nitro Express. And it was considered uh, more reasonable, especially in Africa and India, when you're dealing with dangerous game, to be able to have two fast shots, boom, boom, than to have boom, and either working a lever or a bolt or something like that, and then another shot. These are right now. And besides, if I'm sporting, you have more than two shots. <laughs> the Americans didn't think so, though. <laughs> and back to John Browning. In 1887, Winchester came to him and said, Hey, Christopher Spencer is coming up with an idea that we don't like. He's developed a thing called a pump shotgun. Remember Christopher Spencer? Developed the Spencer rifle, drove his car to work. He's also the, the basis for... Uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. This guy was brilliant. Well, Winchester said to Browning, said, look, we need a repeating shotgun, but we're known for lever action, so you have to make a lever action. Browning said, but I got a pump action designed already. He said, we don't care. We want a lever action. He said, okay. So he came up with the 1887. And this is great. <laughs> That's like, I mean, now is that industrial? <laughs> and it's got a five round magazine. One in the chamber, but you can also have one in here, too. So you actually have seven shots. And in days before hunting regulations, <laughs> right, you know, I thought, oh, there's, there's a few hundred of them. <laughs> <laughs> now we know where the passenger pigeon was. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. You know, marketing. Uh, these were very popular, not only among hunters, but also at Western lawmen. <coughs> George Scarborough. She was a Western uh, lawman in, um, in El Paso in 1895, killed another lawman, uh, a guy named John Selman, using his 87 shotgun. 
John Selman is the guy that killed John Wesley Hardin, who was probably the top, well, top kills as far as gunfighters go, uh, known to have killed at least 40 men in his career. Well, John Selman shot him in the back of the head to avoid such complications as getting himself shot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Scarborough he used a shotgun. So in fact, that's something that uh, um, Wyatt Earp wrote that. Don't use a pistol. Use a shotgun. Better yet, shoot him from a ways away with a rifle. <laughs> Probably why the man lives so damn long. <laughs> famous person who carried this? Oh, that's right. Now, I can't do it because I'll break my fingers if I try, but oh. um, spin this around and ride a motorcycle. <laughs> and you got it. Okay, that's what they, the uh, heavily modified by studio gunsmiths, they use an 87 shotgun for turn. I mean, I use an auto loader. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you can use that with one hand if you have to. So remember that next time you're in a gunfight and get winged, you need an 87 shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I had mentioned, John Browning had a pump shotgun in the works when Winchester said he won a lever action. And in 1892, they introduced their well, 1892 pump shotgun. And it didn't work so good. So they revised it in 1897. They came up with their 97 shotgun. And this is great. Um, an American general named Hugh Scott said, in the, as far as the Philippines go, the best way to deal with the paramentos, um, paramentados, uh, is not with a pistol or a rifle, but with a pump shotgun. And by God, I think he was right. The, um, Five shots, one in the magazine, and uh, if you've ever watched The Wild Bunch, they're using 97 shotguns. They're kind of awkward in that they've got a hammer, but that's also kind of cool because you don't need to put a safety on it, you just put it, you know, got a hammer, you know if it's cocked or not. Um, the United States Army, actually, because the Germans were, in World War, late World War I, were issuing out some machine guns, oh, my guy didn't put it. Um, we said, hey, we can do that. We got shotguns. We shoot the same number of bullets out, uh, just all at once instead of one at a time. <laughs> and the Germans said, that's not sporting. We're going to execute all your guys because we fight with them. And Pershing said, no, you're not. We'll start executing your guys. We got a lot more of them. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, but they used these. They, they, Winchester developed uh, a front. Uh, Thing to put on the end of the barrel with a uh, bayonet lug to take them on 1917 bayonet, which comes out to about there. <laughs> now, I don't know if anybody ever really used them, but they were handy for when you go into a uh, you crawl up to a, a casement bunker and you just sort of lean up over it and you put your finger <laughs> <on> the <bayonet. laughs> to the window. And an actually, a cool thing about this one is if you keep the trigger pull. Keeps on going. <laughs> okay. So now we're a little bit past half, half past. I'm going to. Oh wait a minute! I forgot. I keep forgetting all these things. The last one. Because. Because we're still playing cowboys. Okay, give us the cowboy. Yes. <laughs> 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 for ranch defense. <laughs> <laughs> now, John Tolliver Thompson was the guy that, invent, that de helped Colt develop the 45 automatic. Thought he knew something about guns. He did. And in 1918, 19, he thought, oh, these Germans have these. Nice little submachine guns. We can do that too. And so, uh, a little too late for World War I, but 1921, Colt started making for Auto Ordnance Corporation the Thompson submachine gun. A 50 round drum magazine. And huh, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> this particular spring.
Springfield rifle. It's a Mark I. It was developed, it was designed to take a thing called a Peterson device, which was a little, you pull up, pull up the bolt, put in this little device, and it was a 32 caliber automatic rifle. A little 32 like pistol mount. The Army thought, oh my God, these could get into the wrong hands, and after the war, they destroyed them all. And these you could buy at a hardware store. <laughs> <laughs> Thompsons were the uh, Irish revolutionaries, and I mean, there's the poem about da, 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 something or another, took the rattle of Thompson gun, and the black and tans, and all that kind of fun stuff. But the uh, Thompson, of course, was not, was not only uh, very popularly used in Chicago, uh, <laughs> perfect for ranch defense, <laughs> but also was adopted by the United States Navy. <laughs> and uh, issued in Nicaragua to the Marine Corps. There were fighting bandits in Nicaragua. Get Smedley Butler's book called War is a Racket. Banana Republic, very eye-opening. Anyway, one of my mom's cousins, a much older guy than her, uh, was actually a Marine in Nicaragua in the late 20s, early 30s. And he said that the, the standard patrol would be a guy with a Tommy gun, a guy with a BAR, you know what that is, and a couple of guys, and a couple of guys with uh, uh, Springfield rifles, and a guy with a shotgun, and everybody's carrying a 45 automatic. So they were really well armed. <laughs> but this became in World War II the standard machine gun early in the war for both the United States and Britain because nobody else was making some machine guns that they could get. So. They're big, they're heavy, they're clunky, they're bloody expensive. They're $200 in 1921. Wow. That was real money in those days. Uh, but they work really, really well. <laughs> okay, now, now, we can take some questions. What I have seen. Question. Sir, what is the uh, standard sniper arms in the, um, say, for First World War and leading up to that time? Well, it didn't have them before World War I. <coughs> In World War One, what they started doing was they take a standard infantry rifle, do the Springfield. They had a 1913 musket sight. I don't know why they call it a musket sight, but it was a scope. And uh, they would use that. Uh, but the British took the the Mauser design, made in the United States P14, uh, 303 British. It was a very accurate rifle, and they would put civilian scopes or modified on another. And that's what the British used. The Germans use Mauser with Zeiss scopes. Probably not. So, sure. Uh, Warren, uh, if uh, you're going to recommend a weapon uh, for you know big game turn of the century, you know, guys, I'm going to go home, hunt rhinoceros, elephants. Six hundred naturally stressed. The big double rifle is probably the it. However, uh, there's an American officer named Romy Evans, fighting Bob Evans. Uh, who's a Started, I mean, he was a, a midshipman in Annapolis when the Civil War started, and he was an admiral in the, um, during the Spanish American War. And he went uh, pig hunting in North Africa, and he used his Winchester Hotchkiss. All the British guys said, Oh, you need to have a double rifle. I said, I think the Winchester will be just nice against the American. And so that's what he used, he used the bolt pack. That was in like 1882 or 83. Fine, you got to have questions. Well, oh, what do I think of a little mat? No. <laughs> <laughs> they're okay, they're awfully big. Yeah, they're huge. They're, they're, they're big. Five or nine shots. Oh, very, nine shots. Very far. And, yeah, and I mean, it's nice to have that little 20 gauge buck shot load, but I'd rather have another pistol. Sir, what point did uh, machine guns become dolphin? Uh, with the Maxim. The, Maxim. Uh, the Gatling and the, the Gatling, Nordenfeld. Gardner, those things that were odd, that were hand cranked, usually had uh, a feed. Just you dump in loose ammunition into a tray, and it would wiggle its way down and be fed in to the to the mechanism. Uh, Hiram Maxim saw that there was a shortcoming in this. You know, you did jams that way, and he developed the belt. Okay, so, uh, 1884, the belt fed. Whatever happened with uh, the idea of like the Lewis gun? 
that was machine gun that was a drum. Oh, um, so that's an odd looking design of drum that to me. Yeah. It really looks steampunk. It does, yes. The Lewis gun was very, very cool. Had a big pan uh, drum magazine that fit on top rather than this way. Basically, all the drum magazines are, are a revolver of, of sorts. Uh, and the Lewis, it was found with with cap and ball revolvers and whatnot that had a tendency to chain fire, that having a cylinder that faced you was a bad idea. So it wasn't too popular. But the, with, with cartridges, it was actually it worked very well. And uh, an American captain named Isaac Lewis invented this machine gun, a very light machine gun that took a 50 or 100, actually a 47 or 94 round drum. Uh, and it was adopted by the Belgians and the British later. Uh, later in World War One, that was called the Belgian rattlesnake because they, they happened to be making them at the time. And when the Germans invaded in 1914, they said, oh, "We're going to use these." And you know, <laughs> da, 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 like a rattlesnake. They were light; they were only 27 pounds, uh, so they were man and portable <laughs> compared to the you know 100 pounds of maximum. Uh, and they. Uh, and they didn't have a belt you had to deal with. They had their own self-contained magazine. They became the standard auxiliary machine gun for aircraft in the British uh, air service. They'd fit up on the top wing, like SE-5s and stuff with camels and stuff. You always see them with a the machine gun on the top. That's a Lewis gun. They had a drum, as you could change it. And there's a great story of a German pilot said he saw a uh, British pilot. The plane was upside down, and he was hanging by the Lewis gun magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, actually, Lewis and Clark carried an air rifle. Air rifles go way back. Right. Um, and uh, the Austrians were issuing air rifles to snipers in the Napoleonic Wars uh, who were given a death sentence if they were caught. Maybe just one in Sherlock Holmes. They uh, uh, tried to kill Holmes with uh, the air rifle that was a sniper from some right. Austrian war somewhere. Exactly, because they were, they were, the butt of these rifles was, uh, were generally made out of, were made out of metal. Now, very high pressure, um, able to take high pressure, and they would pump them up. And they had machines that, on a wagon that would pump up, and you'd carry two or three of these. And uh, the thing was, they were silent and smokeless. And so that's why the, the French didn't like them being used against them, because they had no idea where the sniper was. They were absolutely silent. Just a boom, and uh, carried a very large ball, and were extremely, extremely useful. The problem was, the shortcoming was, you had to have this big machine to pump up the darn thing. Uh, and you, 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 know, you just had a, a limited number of rounds that you could fire. So how many of these weapons, if any, were actually supersonic rounds? Uh, pretty much everything smokeless. Okay. Uh, speed of sound was about, actually most of them were smokeless, supersonic. Speed of sound like 900. 770 miles. And how many feet per second? <laughs> <laughs> it's around a little under 1,000 feet per second. And um, a 45 is under that, but a 9 millimeter is over that. Uh, this time, were there any handheld explosive uh, weapons? You mean like a rocket propelled grenade? Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of. Pressed over yours. Manual. There, there was a device called the Pritchard grenade that was used during the Civil War. Well, this is like, I guess this is going to blow up. It was like a cast iron. Easter egg and it had a wooden tail just stabilized on the end it had a flat plunger and the same percussion caps that you use on, on these rifles you put it in and you threw it like a lawn dart. And it happened to land just right, it would set off the detonator. They also had a horrendous one that had looked like a thermal detonator from Return of the Jedi. The entire inside was covered with percussion caps. So wherever it landed it would go off.
Yeah, yeah. I did. I talked a little bit about the new ones. Yeah. I'll tell you about that a little later. Who else? I saw another hand pop up somewhere. Sir. I heard that the Pope outlawed or came up with an edict against the air rifle. Oh, entirely possible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just to make it. With the uh, <clears throat> advent of the smokeless powders, the really early smokeless powders, was there also a jump in chamber pressure like the later oh, ones? Absolutely. They blew up a lot of guns. <laughs> <laughs> you know, guys, especially when when smokeless powder and black powder was in, smokeless was somewhat established. Not only when they were developing it, but when it became established, and a lot of guys were used to doing their own reloading. Mm -hmm. And with a black powder cartridge, you fill it up, put the bullet on there, and you're ready to go. Smokeless use a lot less volume. And old guy, fill it up. We're ready to go. Uh, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> the problem with trap uh, doors. Yes. And uh, the, the pressure spikes are very different between black powder and smokeless powder. And so they definitely had to improve the steels. That was one of the big things when I had to design a new set of new types of guns to go with these smokeless powders because you have the, uh, the pressure differentials and they had to build new tooling to make them because you're using uh, tougher steels. I mean, there's a whole logistical train behind this uh, develop, development of powder. The one thing I mentioned was nitrocellulose powder used by the Germans, the Americans, that are French, the British use cordite. Slightly different, still a smokeless powder. The reason they call it cordite was because it was cut literally into little strings, right. little cords. And they just stack a whole bunch of those in the cartridge. And uh, rather than, I mean, it came with a flake cartridge, they chop it up real fine, but um, you open up a World War I British cartridge and then it's full of spaghetti. <laughs> That's very explosive spaghetti. <laughs> so, time do we have? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we need oh it's almost fine. Okay, I guess we're going to get out of here. Yeah. Thank you very much.